Excellent. Um, all right, well, fair to say that there is no more vexing problem for democracy uh, around the world than the flood of hate speech and disinformation um, that um, uh, is, pops up regularly online. Uh, and we've got a great uh, panel here of people who are on the front lines of dealing with that very issue. Um, and um, let me uh, introduce uh, them, Dina Hussein is the global head of policy at Meta, otherwise known as Facebook, um, and is directly responsible for dealing with um, the uh, uh, terrorism and terrorism content that um, uh, pops up on her social media platform. Um, Amy Larson is director of strategy and business uh, management at uh, Microsoft and um, has headed up a um, team that's working on ways to promote democracy and counter anti-democratic uh, um, uh, uh, posts um, uh, on social media. And uh, Zach, uh, Zach uh, Schwitze um, is uh, the co-founder of Limbic, which is a um, uh, not a social media platform, but a company that is uh, specifically uh, trying to address these very issues. So, a lot of insights that these people can offer us on this. And Dean, I'd like to start out with you, um, because um, you're directly responsible at Meta for uh, monitoring terrorism-related content and taking it down if necessary. Give us some insights into how you actually do that and how the process works. Yeah, I'm happy to, Michael. Um, first off, I'd like to thank you for hosting us in, in the panel and to the Soufan Center and the, the Global Security Forum for a, an excellent gathering once again. Can't hear me? <laughs> OK. Um, I'm going to try and speak up. Uh, first off, I want to thank everybody for bringing us together. Um, a special thanks to, to the coordinators because I know this has been an effort and a labor of love, so I appreciate that. Um, I think the best way to, to take you through what we do is really look at the life cycle of what a piece of content that's abusive looks like on our platform and the steps that it takes to, to go through to sort of get to a place where it's addressed. So our team really I, I head up the policy development arm of the counterterrorism team, exactly to Michael's point. And we look at things from a three-pronged approach. The first is we create the policies themselves. So we sit within a, a, a group that looks at dangerous organizations and individuals. So that includes everything from terrorist actors, but also hate organizations, so neo-Nazi supremacists, that kind of grouping. But we also look at criminal organizations, violent non-state armed groups, um, mass murderers, serial killers, um, attempted mass uh, violence. So what we've done is we've created a bespoke set of tools that we can then deploy to address this kind of content. So we've got the policies, that's the first prong. The second prong is when a piece of content comes up, we first assess it against those policies. And if it is in violation of those policies, we remove it. But sometimes we don't have to wait until we review it to cross-reference it with our policies. You also have a predetermined set of uh, pieces of content that we know are violating. So we deploy what we call automation against that. So we've got an incredible swath of, of tooling that includes things like image and video matching. So we know, for example, that Daesh and ISIS put out um, regular newsletters. So we'll find that and we'll match it. And then finally, beyond when the- When you say match it, what do you mean? Oh, I mean, forgive me. So to clarify, what we'll do is we'll, we'll take that content, we'll save it. So Nebuch is a newsletter that comes out on a regular basis. We'll get that from intelligence vendors or experts. We'll save it. We'll, we will refer to it as banking. Once we've saved that piece of content, what we will do is if we ever, try, if we ever find that a user is trying to upload that content, we will block it from being, from being um, posted. There are a few exceptions, and I can go into that for news coverage and others, but that's a way in which we deploy automation. There's also audio matching that's become very much a useful tool for us. So beyond the, the technical aspect of this, we also have partnerships that we deploy. So 
we're going to talk about the Global Internet Forum in this dialogue, and we're going to talk about uh, the way in which we partner with other tech platforms. But there's another aspect of the work that we do, which is we partner with folks like Priyank and, and Rachel and Moonshot and other organizations to say, hey, we are almost surely not going to have all the answers here, and we can't we can't expect that all of the information is going to come from within the system. So we need to be having dialogue and engaging with folks outside of this organization because groupthink is never going to be the, the, the best approach. So partnerships are another part. So I have a, a, a number of follow-up questions um, uh, as long as we're on this subject. Um, um, you talk about whether, uh, whether the content posted um, violates your policies. Are the policies specifically about the nature of the content, in other words, the person um, who's posting or the group that's posting mm -hmm. is advocating violence mm -hmm. or terrorism act? Or is it uh, that they are affiliated with a group that has been identified mm -hmm. as a terrorist group? That's a, that's a very, very good question, and this is where I double down here and I emphasize I am only speaking for Facebook and for Meta's sort of family of apps, not other tech platforms, because we do actually differ quite significantly from some other platforms. We have what we call a designations-based um, approach to these organizations. So we created our own definition of terrorism. Controversial statement, I know, mm -hmm. but we spent. And you want to share what that <laughs> definition is? I, I, I can't. Well, I, you can find it. So yeah. we, you can, if you go on, if you do a quick search for Facebook's community standards, we made it public, um, and it took many, many years to iterate. It was not. We didn't just come up with it. We had an initial definition, and then we got feedback from, you know, special UN rapporteurs, academics who are like, hey, that's not going to work, and good luck with that. And so it evolved, and you can actually go through and see the different iterations of that definition because we now, the community standards um, tool that we have lets you go back in time and see what we've changed. So if we've messed up somewhere, so you can say So look, it. let's take Hezbollah. Yeah. You know, U.S. designates it as yeah. a terrorism organization. In yeah. Lebanon, it's a political party. So um, there yeah. are, so there's a, a few. Is, is anything related to Hezbollah taken down by Meta? So for, yeah, for, from our perspective. So for, regardless of, even if it's advocating a political position in the context of Lebanese politics or in Mideast politics, so there, you're going to take it down even, even though it's not advocating violence in any way, shape, or form. So it's not as clear cut as that. We okay. have we have um, carve outs, so carve outs for medical, so let's say medical services. So yes, to a certain extent, I can say that if you are representing this organization, then yes, that's the the the, the basic response. But it's not as simple as that because there is a little bit more nuance. I'm going to say that our the way that we approach designations is not. Um, it's not based off of any one country's list. The reason why I mentioned we created a, a definition of terrorism is once we have that definition of terrorism, it looks at multiple different indicators. It's that you're using violence, that you're targeting groups that are not directly it, involved in, in conflict, that you, it's premeditative, and that you are using we don't care, we are ideologically agnostic, but that you're using this violence to move forward a political, religious, or ideological goal, that the violence is being used towards that end. Once that list is created, there are different prongs that get deployed. So for terrorism, any praise, any support, or any representation of those organizations comes down. So a great example is if, I, I, if bin Laden had been creating a, a cooking show, for example, that's a where he doesn't say anything at all, that video would come down because for us, anything that's produced by these organizations is also removed. So are, is the um, uh, Turkestan Islamic Party or the East Turkestan Liberation Organization on your list? I will have to go back and check. Okay, these the are the very, primary very, Uyghur very organizations in China that uh, you know, are advocating you know, separation from China. Of course, mm -hmm. Chinese have cracked down and have uh, put up to a million Uyghurs in concentration camps. Um, you know, these are, you know, pretty uh, uh, difficult issues, yeah. and um, you know, a lot of people around the world would cheer um, uh, what either of these two groups are doing mm -hmm. to resist 
clear Chinese oppression, actually Chinese oppression that has been defined internationally by many groups as genocide. Um, do you feel comfortable taking down groups so that I, are resisting Chinese oppression? I can't because I I don't know if they are on the designations list because it's a pretty it's a pretty long list because it's. It but you made it public. Back. We can all see this list. The list itself is not public, but the definitions are all public, and there are multiple le reasons why the list itself is not public. Because when I, I'll give you an example, yes. when lists have been leaked before, mm -hmm. within 24 hours all of the pages have changed their names, and any logos that our automated detection had, within 24, this is, this, is not a co this is not something that I am sort of giving you a hypothetical around. I know this for a fact because they changed their name and their logo within 24 hours of it leaking that, the, that that list existed. Not to mention the number of threats that my folks got. I will not mention the country in this meeting, but I, the number of threats that my people on the ground got just as a result of that leak were horrific. So mm -hmm. we're trying to move to an area where transparency, I think it's of the utmost importance that, it, that we do become more transparent. I'm still figuring out how to do that and not be adversarially on the back foot because of it. Right. Although full, mm -hmm. fully acknowledging that there is a, a, a piece of work that needs to be done there. Um, Amy, um, you at Microsoft Um, Amy, you head up this team at, uh, at Microsoft that's been working on protecting and promoting democracy. Tell us uh, what it is you're doing in this space and how you go about it. Sure, thank you so much. And before I get started, I want to thank everyone here. Thank you so much uh, to the Global Security Forum. Um, I've so enjoyed being a part of this so far and, and getting to learn from all the panelists. Um, who've come before. Uh, it's really an honor to be here and to follow uh, these interesting discussions and the really important work that you're all doing. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, the Democracy Forward team. Uh, so I'm director of strategy uh, of, the, of the Democracy Forward team. And we work to safeguard open and secure democratic processes, uh, promote a healthy information ecosystem, and advance corporate civic responsibility. So each of those has a broad range of partners and components. Um, but if you think a little bit about the importance of uh, the role of technology in promoting and protecting, um, at least the, uh, to start with, the infrastructure that a lot of today's democracies are run on top of, um, maybe I'll start with um, some of our work uh, in response to the war in Ukraine which is in addition to our um, mandate that I just described. Um, so I think Microsoft didn't intend to uh, come to the war in Ukraine um, as sort of um, a, a key participant, but it turned out, of course, that um, Microsoft infrastructure and uh, internet service providers generally play a really significant role um, in maintaining the connectivity and the servers um, uh, that a lot of both defensive and offensive activity are taking place on. So um, although the kinetic attack began on February 24th, uh, the actual first cyber shots were fired uh, on February 23rd, and those were conducted by Russia against Ukraine. And we were able to see those from our headquarters um, in Redmond, Washington, before anyone else was able to. Uh, and that, of course, preceded the kinetic attack that began the next day. Um, and so one of the things that we've done, in addition to our immediate response, uh, company-wide, not just my team, of course, uh, was putting 16 out of 17 government ministries into the cloud for free because they asked us to, and that was a few uh, days before the Russians targeted um, the Ukrainians' one on-premises server with a missile attack. Um, in addition to that, since then, we've been both tracking the cyber activity that's targeting Ukraine and NATO allies as well outside of uh, Ukraine, as well as the disinformation foreign influence operations overlay on top of that. And we have terrific teams that uh, provide a lot of insight uh, and support in terms of those activities and efforts. And then our response has been 
um, broader than that as well. So I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but you know, we've used our AI to map the destruction of uh, historical sites and hospitals and schools and shared that information with the United Nations in order to hold Russia accountable for war crimes. Um, we used Skype to provide 31 million minutes of free calling to make sure that people were able to get in touch with each other. Um, we've generated, donated over $430 million company-wide in, in goods and, and services to help uh, respond to the crisis there. Used LinkedIn to provide refugee trainings um, and job uh, trainings and coaching and services and grants. Um, we've also started a foundation, a partnership with the uh, Olina Zelenska Foundation to try to rebuild and we've brought in uh, tens of thousands of laptops and licenses for free to reconnect um, Ukraine's schools and reconnect children uh, so that they can keep learning. Um, those are just a few of the pieces of, of the company's response that I'm really proud of. I think it's um, not a forum where, um, in this case, you know, Microsoft intended to play a big role, but I think that's sort of the broader picture as well. Uh, can can I just break in, because uh, just a side question occurred to me here. Microsoft is a business. Is somebody paying Microsoft to do this? Uh, we did not get paid for any of what I've just mentioned. Right, so this is uh, just a philanthropic um, endeavor by uh, the company. We saw a crisis and responded in the way that we thought was the most responsible. But in, in, in Dina's case, I understand why it's in Meta's interest to do what she's doing. I'm not clear I quite understand how it's in Microsoft's interest, other than as corporate citizen of the world, um, but I don't, I'm, not, I'm not seeing a nexus to its business interests. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think inherently it's worthy of stepping up to the plate um, when situations and vulnerable communities uh, uh, arise, and especially in crises like Ukraine, um, part of our initial response as well was um, making sure that uh, RT and Sputnik were not on the Windows App Store any longer and downranking that content. And, um, and so making sure that, you know, from that point of view, you're not facilitating um, what are fairly clear wrongdoings. Um, but sort of more, more generally to your question, you know, sure, it, is there a bottom line? I guess, I guess you could say so in, in several senses, um, although I'll just emphasize that I think, you know, the leadership of my team and our organization uh, does believe in tech playing a positive role for good, for good's sake. I think that is absolutely one of the factors. There are also business motives, sure. I mean, 97% of uh, Microsoft's business is conducted and revenue is, is generated from democracies. So if you think about it, you know, why are democracies uh, in general a place where business does well? Well, you have a stable rule of law, you have a, a positive and predictable um, economic environment. Um, it may not uh, you know, always be perfectly predictable, but it sort of beats the alternative in a lot of cases. Um, and I think, you know, more fundamentally, Microsoft is a business that's run on trust. So, if we fail in allowing our customers to be victims of cyber attacks, we're not going to be selling very many uh, Surface Pros the next day, right? So it is actually fundamental to the business proposition, and one of the reasons that we can take such a strong and adamant stance in protecting security and advocating for the importance of that trust. So um, when we talk about cyber attacks, I mean, that's criminal activity. It's, it's pretty easy to identify as something that um, it's in everybody's interest to address. Um, but uh, this issue is much broader and includes, you know, the bucket of disinformation. Um, I was asking Dina how Meta defines terrorist activity that needs to get uh, taken down. How do you define and identify disinformation? Yeah, so I think the, the generally accepted um, framework is that disinformation um, is information that's not fully accurate or factually accurate, and there's an additional piece of intent to cause harm or deceive, um, whereas misinformation um, has those characteristics without necessarily an intent to cause harm. So if you think about... Or deceit, not just deceit. harm. Harm can be physical harm, but, you know, deceit is... Correct. You're getting into the political sphere. There. Yes, yes. Right. There's, a, there's a malign intention um, right. as, as part of the disinformation that we're, I think, most, most concerned about. 
So, right, so um, I think that's a, a great segue into some of um, the work that we've done. Um, so our information ecosystem uh, pillar involves um, work on restoring and rebuilding journalism and protecting journalists um, and uh, producing some media literacy content and trying to educate uh, and provide resources to customers in order to help them understand um, you know, we produced a like spot the deep fake quiz with one of our partners from the University of Washington. You know, because this is really a it's it's a it's a full team activity to counter disinformation and to prevent the worst uh, harms that threat actors would try to uh, in, impose on our societies, democratic and otherwise. So you know, we can provide tools and and we do. Um, one of the things we do is is provide like a, a plugin that you can download. And um, then it, it'll um, assess journalistic content according to uh, accepted journalistic standards, and you know it's outsourced to um, several third parties who are nonpartisan, nonprofit, and it uh, results in a label, kind of like a nutrition label. Um, so it'll show kind of this is a red-rated site or this is a um, you know green-rated site, and people you know are up to it's it's up to people's freedom of choice uh, and freedom of expression to decide whether or not they would like to consume a healthy news diet um, now ultimately i think democracy depends on people understanding the environment they live in the challenges that we face the threats that they're under and the role that they play in helping to sustain a healthy information ecosystem so so that's part of part of the answer to your question um, we also you know work on um, uh, across, you know, the, th the threat landscape as well. We provide account protections through our account guard program uh, to make sure that the, you know, digital accounts of journalists and nonprofits and healthcare workers during the pandemic, political campaigns, election officials, all of those who are um, helping to shore up the foundations of democracy to make sure that their digital profiles are protected from uh, the technical point of view. I mean, the reason um, I was raising the question before about, you know, and deceit is because these often get very tricky and um, one person's disinformation is another person's totally valid information. Classic case from the 220 election, um, uh, the New York Post um, uh, publishes a story about Hunter Biden's laptop. Um, which has all sorts of embarrassing stuff on it. Um, the uh, 50 former U intelligence officials, most of them affiliated with the Biden campaign, release a letter that says this has all the hallmarks of disinformation. And Twitter, I don't know what Facebook did, but I know Twitter took down the New York Post um, uh, Twitter account as a result of that for a while. Um, was that the right call? I mean, I can't speak to what went on behind the scenes in, in Twitter or otherwise. How, how, did, how did you at, at Microsoft process uh, this? I don't think that we encountered those types of questions. I yeah. mean, we're in the uh, perhaps right. fortunate position in this case of you know, not being a social media company. Um, and, you know, that doesn't mean there aren't difficult choices. I think something that we've tried to do is to make sure that um, the third parties that we use to assess, you know, is this something, you know, is this something ultimately that amounts to disinformation, um, you know, or sort of makes it sort of um, go up or go down in terms of the ranking, is to really rely on uh, both open source intelligence as well as uh, trusted third parties that are all nonpartisan, all nonprofit, and there are several right. of them. So Microsoft doesn't want to be in the business of being the arbiter of truth. That's not what we signed right. up to be, and we don't want right. to do that. Um, I think that's probably similar to other tech companies, although I would never want to speak for them. Um, but I do raise it because, I mean, that's an illustration of how tricky this gets. Yeah. Because, in fact, I mean, since that happened, New York Times, Washington Post, other news organizations have authenticated the emails that were on the Hunter Biden laptop, and no uh, evidence has come out that the Russians had any role in it. So in that case, the arbiters of disinformation got it wrong and took down information. We can all debate whether how relevant it was to the campaign, but it was information that clearly was of interest to some portions of the electorate. Um, 
Zach, did um, uh, Twitter make the right call on taking the Hunter Biden laptop down? Uh, I have some personal views on it, but I well, sort of echo that's what I'm it. asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the moment, yeah. And I think to your point, Michael, it you know evolves uh, in the understanding. We saw that with the pandemic that you know information that was perceived as incorrect or factually incorrect early on, you know, with uh, more evolved understanding, um, you know, was proven or disproven. But I think the to take a sort of a giant step back, um, and thank you to the TSC folks and um, you know everybody involved as usual. You guys put on an incredible show, and it's an honor to be part of it. And um, to Dina and uh, Amy as well, um, to be sitting up here with you know you and uh, the the organizations that you represent. Um, most of you probably haven't heard of Limbic. Um, I think we have an interesting perspective because when we look at the information space, um, we take a real kind of organizational focus to it. So not as much looking at how do you build societal resilience individual at the individual level, but uh, more and more there's. Um, real consequence that organizations face in, you know, due to information threats. And organizations could be governments, government agencies, NGOs, um, and then uh, corporations. And how we got into this, I'm going to come back to, you know, sort of the question that was, uh, or at least uh, the framing of the question. Um, we got into this sort of disinfo space because a, a government official asked um, or was looking to classify truth and fiction at scale. And I sort of looked at that problem and said, I don't think it's possible, um, mainly because truth is subjective. So if you think about it not as mis- and disinformation, as Amy said, you know, which forces somebody to be in a position of deciding what's true and what's false, but look at it through the lens of believability and the way we think about it at Limbic is whether or not something is actually true, if it is believed by a segment of the population and it's likely to elicit engagement, it's potentially consequential. So we developed a capability that tries to identify predictively is there potential imp impact with information that's out there online. Again, regardless of whether it's true, but if you see that early enough, it gives you a chance to do something about it proactively. And We've investigated this a lot. I know there's a ton of third-party research out there about um, the benefits of, um, or just the application of pre-bunking versus debunking, how much more effective pre-bunking is versus dealing with this stuff and trying to mitigate in the moment of crisis. So we really kind of evolved this capability to, one, give a predictive look, and two, make it based on believability rather than what's true or what somebody wants to believe is factually correct. So. In the Hunter Biden example, I preface it by saying I you know, have some personal views, and I think with all of this stuff, um, it's constantly changing. We have sort of live in a post-truth world now, which just makes all this stuff a whole lot more complex. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it would feel off-brand to say that it even matters, right? Because we're looking at it not through the lens of is it true or is it not, but if people believe it, it's potentially problematic. Well, it's problematic if it's not true. It's not problematic if it is true, right? I would argue that truthful information or information that's believed by some to be true is problematic for some. And I'll give you an example, uh, you know, to sort of take a step back again. A lot of this stuff we can look at through the, you know, advertising and marketing lens. Because if you're trying to sell somebody soap, really foundationally what you're trying to do is get them to buy your brand or believe in your brand versus a competitor, right? And the word nobody likes to use in this space is influence, but effectively you're trying to influence somebody's you know, emotional decision making. And I think when we look at this, if we take truth out of the equation and say, I have a version of a narrative, the world, whatever, you or whoever we're talking to may have a different view of a situation, the world, et cetera. And what I'm effectively trying to do is say, how do I get you closer aligned with my view? And I think if we look at the pandemic and vaccine hesitancy through this lens, it was there's a lot of communities out there that were vaccine hesitant, vaccine uh, vaccination rates were lower in these communities. The reasons why the narratives that were driving this hesitancy were very different across all of these different communities, but the government 
their objective was the same, right? We want people to be less hesitant about the vaccine. So can we understand sort of where that, hesita that hesitancy is coming from so that we have a better understanding of what we can do to pull them closer to our views? I'm a little, you know, you said that the, 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 the Twitter did the right thing at, at first. And, you know, the, the classic um, uh, version of, you know, that we're taught in school about freedom of the speech is marketplace of ideas. That, you know, all ideas should be on the table, you know, let advocates, uh, you know, duke it out and the public can decide. Um, if, if, if information is restricted by social media companies, that sort of undercuts the whole principle of freedom of ideas, of freedom of speech and marketplace of ideas, no? So how is it, so how do you defend then social media companies taking down content based on sketchy claims from political actors? So I would say, Two things. One, and I, I don't know, you know, a lot of the inner workings, but my understanding was the reason it was pulled down is because it violated Twitter's terms. So, if that's the case, then what what terms? The uh, nudity. So uh, whether or not that's correct, but two, that sort of you know goes to the second point, and uh, you know, Dean and Amy, I'm sure have you know much better understandings and perspectives on this, but as a you know, private company, they have, I think, the ability to define what their terms of service are, and if somebody breaches those, pull content down. Yeah, I mean, I should also point out that they also took down content um, suggesting that um, COVID came from uh, the lab in Wuhan instead of natural occurrence. Um, that was viewed by the government as a conspiracy theory um, at the time. Today, uh, we know that the FBI and the Energy Department think that that's the most likely explanation for the origins of COVID. Um, same, same question on that. Were they right to take down um, uh, COVID uh, from a lab stories initially? Again, I have personal thoughts on that. I think it shows, you know, in the pandemic context, uh, evolution of uh, information. And um, I think there needs to be a bit more understanding that decisions that were made, you know, today and change tomorrow or six months or eight, you know, a year from now with new information, it wasn't done. It wasn't necessarily politically motivated, which I think sort of so easily easy for people to put it in a political lens now when it was really just new information became available and based on that you know a company like meta or twitter decided to make different uh decisions i i think the the problem that people have with this is um uh, are we relying on the government to tell us what's true and what's not and if we are doesn't that raise a whole host of even greater problems for democracy so along those lines Dina how often do you hear from the government about what you're doing and how often do they make suggestions recommendations or more to you so the the lens that I'm speaking through is very much one of the counterterrorism work that we do, so I, I, I will highlight that's probably something to situate ourselves within. Mm -hmm. um, just checking that everybody can hear me. Um, so in terms of engagement with governments, we do, we engage with governments all of the time. We engage with the civil society all of the time. Are they calling we you or are you calling them? It depends on this, it, honestly, it's a, it's a two-way street, but it depends on the situation. In a so in a day-to-day -day when we are going about our work, usually it's just a matter of, hey, if, if a civil society actor or a government has a piece of information that they want to flag to us, for example, there's a beheading video on this platform, you might want to take a look. There's a... A beheading video on the platform, you need to take a look. So we have channels that are clearly dedicated to say, hey, law enforcement might have information that's useful for us to know about. Now, there isn't anything, we don't, um, we don't preference anybody over the other. So we have law enforcement teams that are based across, across the globe that engage with different governments. Now, on the other side, governments have different resources allocated to internet and, and internet service providers and social media companies. So 
we have a sort of, a, the approach to us is, is equitable. You can come and speak to the, com I, I can only speak to my company and for my work, which is the terrorism side of things. Mm -hmm. So we've got liaisons that are building out um, these partnerships because they are fruitful. It is useful to know in advance, hey, an attack happened, here is the content that might be on your platform. Or, hey, there is a, a piece of, of information out here that is saying that, hey, if you, if you assess this network, you might find some more information. On the other side, there are other, there are other factors from what I think you're getting at, Michael, which is inequity in the representation. So when that occurs, I think that's when you default to does the company have a set of rules that say, hey, we will accept this information. To Zach's point, we will assess it against our terms of service. Anything beyond that, that becomes a legal issue, right? That's a, there's a whole other process there. So there are um, protections that go into place. But another part of it is also, you pointed out transparency, right? Mm -hmm. the, the fact that there, is, there are certain governments that have things that are called internet referral units. So entire units that are meant to refer pieces of content for tech companies to review against their terms of service. We've gone a step ahead and said, okay, here are the number of times we get referrals from these governments. You can go and see it on our transparency center. So wait, the governments are telling you what content violates your what terms of service? And, That's what and, they think. And, and is that their, should that be their job? That's isn't, a, that, isn't that your job, not their job? So we are doing, so we're doing yeah. that internally. Right. We are, from that perspective, we are assessing all of these people, these of, the pieces of content that we are made aware of, that we find through our tooling, through image and video matching, through trusted partners. We're assessing all of that, but there are some situations, I'm, I'm very much not above saying we're not gonna get everything. Right. And there are certain situations where I have gotten it very, very wrong. And so I, I I hope that we continue to be humble enough to say we're not going to be able to do this perfectly alone. So whether it be civil society partners through the Trusted Flagger part program or if it's government partners that say, hey, you missed this thing and we think it violates your terms of service. That is something that I actually, I, I think is, is fine because it, un, until it goes beyond, hey, does this violate your terms of service? That's the, I think, the second question. So you know, I've, I've covered many terrorist acts over in, you know, for quite some time, and in many of them, what you often get told by law enforcement right away is that they've contacted you yeah. and told you to take the content of the perpetrator or suspected mm -hmm. perpetrator of the terrorist act mm -hmm. down. Uh, um, it, it, I said you, I was thinking <laughs> of the wife. company, but... Now that, but since I'm, but since you're here, are they calling you? Yeah, I'm a you? very minimal partner. No. <laughs> and no, tell not. us about how no, that works. they don't call up Dina. Yeah. That would be very scary to me. Yeah. Um, no, what they do is they, they go through the, the channels that we have set up. So we have mm -hmm. a law enforcement flagging channel. We've got law enforcement POCs because I shouldn't be the first person you reach out to. Mm -hmm. I write the policies. I do, it's, right. They're... There is a dynamic that is a little sac like there's there is a little bit of a of a building in a gatekeeping process that I think is useful for everybody. So they don't call me; they will call our law enforcement liaison that is partnered up with them, wherever they are in the world, whomever they are, and that person will say, "Okay, let's vet this information. How much information can we get from open source and from open source tools? What are we seeing on the platform?" And then we will make a decision. We're not told what to do. We are flagged certain content, and then there is another world where there are local jurisdictions where the law is you remove this content. That's a conversation that's a legal conversation, and it's jurisdiction-based, and we, it's in, more in other countries, or in, in other countries, yeah, yeah. in right. other countries, in Europe, and right. I mean, well, it's, it, it genuinely differs from one country to the next. Yeah. There are some European countries that their jurisdictional. Um, their laws dictate certain things and others dictate others. And, and that also goes to the point that you're making around how do we define terrorism? We, we, we don't just take on board an entire list of folks. We don't just say, okay, thank you, we're gonna just deploy this. Because in the same way that information from different governments differs in mm -hmm. quality and accuracy, and, and hey, I don't envy our law enforcement folks. When an attack happens, it is genuinely, there is a lot going on. And so I, 
I think when we look at our partnerships with governments, it's a symbiotic re relationship, but it isn't, it cannot just be viewed as you partner up with a, with a, a government. We partner up with anybody that is willing to share author authoritative information with us. So just to, to wrap up the point that we were talking about in terms of the legal dynamics, whether it be a removal request or whether it be a list that folks are giving us, we have to take a look at the merits of, of these requests. So for an example that I always give, the reason that we created a definition of terrorism for ourselves was the definitions of terrorism across the globe, there is no agreement. We've this, it's sort of like I teach terrorism 101 and, it, and it, it, there is no agreement on a definition. But if you were just gonna take a country's list, not all countries list out organizations. Sometimes they just list individuals. And different, or, uh, different country lists have different political dynamics involved. Sometimes they're slower. There's, a, there's an aspect of political um, balance or imbalance. There's an aspect of speed. What is your process to get somebody on there? There's an excellent, I will suggest papers left, right, and center because I am an academic and researcher at heart, but there's an excellent paper from Brookings that looked, compared five eyes lists and looked at what were the common organizations on these lists and it said, well, yes, there's a, a, a very good point about the danger presented by these organizations, but there's also a lobbying aspect to this as well. So when tech companies look at these lists, we, we are going to look at indicators and try and at least for our, our company, so take into account, does it meet our definition? Mm -hmm. But another thing to also mention in these lists is w beyond how do organizations get on these lists, not all lists have the same impact. In certain countries, a list means every, every stop will be, everything will be deployed to, to prevent these organizations from existing. Legal, um, there are many things that will come about. And then there are some other jurisdictions where it's, it's sort of a, a, a dissolving of the organization and the members don't get affected at all. In other situations, it's simply a financial impact. So what I'm saying is the relationship with governments is complicated. We welcome engagement from all governments, but we still have built into place a process of adjudicating the information we're getting. Um, switching gears a little bit, Amy, you during the uh, uh, 2000, the 2020 presidential election, uh, participated in a, a tabletop exercise for about what could go wrong. Mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry. And, uh, and how to make sure. Yep, I was saying Amy had uh, conducted a, a tabletop exercise about the. Uh, 2020 presidential race um, uh, in the run-up about what could go wrong um, and what needed to be done to make sure things don't go wrong. Tell us a little bit about that and did you get into at the time the prospect that the results of the election um, would um, create controversy amid allegations um, of fraud by one of the candidates? Sure, happy to happy to speak about that. And and just to um, clarify that uh, during 26, uh, 2020, I was um, working as a, a lawyer, um, and this was one of the pro bono projects that I was on. So it was a a, a series of six um, uh, preparatory sessions, um, largely conducted with the Brennan Center for Justice, based in New York, um, and then Microsoft was the team that I'm currently on, uh, was also involved, which is how they first came onto my radar. And I thought, wow, what is, I wonder what Microsoft's doing here, that's odd. Um, but it was, um, so it was a series of, of, of six sessions, um, including a tabletop exercise. Um, there were over 400 uh, state and local elections officials. Um, we took them through a series of topics on ransomware, um, safe election administration during COVID, uh, which was, you know, an additional challenge on top of all of the other challenges that they were encountering at that time. Um, and, of course, sort of a, a series of crisis simulation activities, um, you know, ranging from uh, sort of threats on the ground to, um, you know, allegations that they might encounter uh, to, you know, a, a, a broad variety of, uh, of potential things that could go wrong. Um, and so there was, there was never uh, any discussion of, you know, sort of like 
the results and, and sort of fraud in the sense of, uh, you know, a political angle to any of that work. Um, it, it fits in, you know, really with the sort of foundational principle of, um, you know, of wanting to safeguard the fundamental building blocks of democracy. What were you most concerned about when you did that tabletop exercise? Um, I mean, <laughs> Honestly, well, myself in my role, uh, there were like 20 virtual breakout rooms, so I was worried that like people would get lost in who knows where, the metaverse <laughs> between breakout rooms. Um, you know, uh, so uh, that was my very proximate concern. Um, you know, I think the election officials were, were you know, have, have been under so much threat and duress. Um, here are nonpartisan officials who are stewards, you know, of, of the electoral infrastructure and process. Um, they don't want to be in the spotlight, they're doing their jobs and, and trying their best to maintain, you know, a safe and fair and free election um, and have become targets uh, in, in so many terrible ways. So, I mean, I think those concerns were top of mind, but, you know, t I think more broadly, what's going to happen in 2020? Um, you know, what if our poll workers all get COVID the day of, you know, the elections? Or, um, you know, uh, what if we run out of um, power and where does our, you know, uh, like backup generator if like all of the e-poll books are down. So, I mean, it's, it's the sort of very unsexy, like nitty gritty um, concerns that, um, you know, I think uh, I'm, I'm so glad that people are thinking about these things and that's what's really going on um, uh, to sort of figure out how they can safely and securely conduct these open and secure democratic so, elections. So the part of that that I think is most relevant to this discussion is, um, question of countering narratives. Because, um, uh, you know, as we all know, after um, Joe Biden won and Donald Trump lost, Trump refused to accept his defeat, and he and his operatives and lawyers started spreading all these conspiracy theories uh, about what had happened. Um, now, those conspiracy theories um, were debunked by judge after judge in courtrooms around the country, by news organizations, by nonprofits. I mean, basically, every piece, every single allegation um, of fraud was shot down in the most convincing of ways to most of us. And yet, on January 6th, you had thousands of people, 2,000, who stormed the Capitol um, because they believe this stuff. So the question, and I guess this is for you, Zach, is how does one counter narratives when it looks to me like all the right things were done to debunk the bogus claims that were being made, and yet people still clung to them and believed in them? Yeah, I think to oversimplify the answer to that, it's not a message problem, it's a messenger problem. And the people that believe some of this conspiratorial content don't believe or don't trust the people that were debunking it, right? So even if there is credible debunking or new information coming available from sources that they don't trust, they're not suddenly going to change their mind or be influenced by that. So when we look at messaging or counter-messaging, as important as the message itself is who is disseminating that message and is there sort of trust and credibility from the messenger to the recipients of that because that's really the only way that any of that's going to resonate. So I can't, won't talk specifically about the election work we do, but I think one of the interesting things with elections is what role you know can government play and where we did some work was in a very apolitical way, what are some kind of infrastructure-related rumors that are out there, right? What time do polls open, um, as one example? And you'll see on various agency sites that there's these rumor control pages. So if you know or you have some insight into who's most likely to believe that type of narrative, right, about changing times or locations of polling stations, then you really want to optimize your response to that rumor on a government website for a particular audience. But it, that is, you know, flawed, right? Because you're only really going to speak to or resonate with people that trust the government as the source of that message. 
So I think really with so much of this stuff, it comes down to even if there is, you know, something's been disproven, how do you deliver that message to the people that, you know, still believe that working, I think it's trying to find partners that have trust and credibility in these different communities and figuring out, you know, where there might be opportunities to deliver the same message or a, you know, it, I'll put it into brand terms, a brand aligned message from somebody other than the brand. And we do a lot of that work on the, in, in the private sector where you have um, a global retailer, for example, that is being attacked because of previous statements it had made about Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And there's a you know, group of people out there that, that believe that to be true. So the company's gonna come out or thinks about coming out and trying to disprove, right? Here's what we've done, or even retract the statement it made months before this. Our advice to them was that's gonna have zero impact on this specific group of people that believe that to be true because they don't trust you. So is there somebody that we can partner with? Is it a journalist? Is it an influencer that has credibility with those people that you currently don't? But when we're dealing with something like QAnon, which is just putting out totally absurd, preposterous stuff, how would you possibly find an interlocutor who could speak to the people who are reading that stuff and believing it and persuade them that they're off in cuckoo land? <laughs> um, I think it's very tricky, and that's why something like QAnon went from, you know, very fringe, very kind of small problem that a lot of people probably at GSF in 2018 or 19 weren't really talking about as that big of a threat. And now, you know, here we are, and we had something like January 6th that was driven by this conspiracy theory. So um, I don't know that there's an easy answer. I think a lot of people have um, looked at how do you infiltrate these communities, um, you know, kind of that... Um, black hat or gray hat type marketing efforts, um, people that have sort of changed their opinion that were sort of entrenched in these uh, thought processes that aren't but still, you know, sort of maintain credibility in those spaces, can you use them? Um, but I don't think there's an easy answer um, in terms of, you know, how to infiltrate well, these look, communities. Well, look, I mean, the, 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 the title of this panel is Countering <laughs> Extremism, Hate and Disinformation. Um, so, yes, it's difficult, but it's exactly, you know, the issue that we need to address. I'd like to hear Michael. Dina and Amy's thoughts on what is really the cosmic issue, you know, uh, in this space for our time. I think I might, just jumping off of what Zach was saying, the panel before us highlighted a really interesting point, which is we're facing different iterations of a similar problem. Whether it is misinformation or disinformation or terrorist propaganda, mm -hmm. what we're seeing is an, a challenge of um, getting users in certain situations to look at content and understand, hey, are certain actors trying to manipulate the way that I am feeling towards this content? And so the point being made by Rachel at Moonshot or Priyank and, and everybody that is working around this kind of inoculation is something that we can carry over. That panel was talking about terrorism, but the tools that they're using do work with, with other um, entities. So if you inoculate a user and you say, okay, how do you, how do you assess a piece of content as you look at it and how do you know if you are purposefully being manipulated? And the reason I say that is, QAnon was really interesting. It wasn't just QAnon that became problematic just within the context of the US. You had Kordinkin in Germany, which was similarly problematic, had some of the symptoms that we were seeing in QAnon. It was a similar violence-inducing conspiracy theory. And to address these things, because we've tried, <laughs> we've looked at this, trying to address them just to debunk to that Zach's point, that very assumption, will only get you so far. Because the really interesting thing about these conspiracy theories is they've just started to take on all of the other conspiracy theories that they merge in with. So it, you look at the evolution of QAnon, you realize it started somewhere and it ended somewhere very much wider that is inclusive of all of these other very far, to, to, mm -hmm. to your point, very far reaching conspiracy theories that are, I think the term you used was cuckoo. <laughs> um, but the one central force that we can use is this inoculation work. Now, this brings into question another portion of things, which is 
Should it be the tech companies that are mainly doing this, or does it need to be a wider breadth of folks? And with that controversial note, I leave <laughs> uh, Amy, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, I'm ha happy to jump in here as well. So, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think we have to also step back and remember that, you know, the, the content, the troublesome content that we see online, it's, um, it's, it's a reflection of deeper issues, whether they're um, individual or sort of the, the human side of this, right, is, you know, if you eliminated all technology, like, people would still find ways, like they did um, millennia and hundreds of years ago, to express whatever their point of view is, right? So um, it's not as though the advent of the internet or social media companies um, created the problems that we see. I think that technologies are, uh, in many ways, uh, a vehicle and a platform for both the best and the worst of humanity. They are just uh, a surface upon which we um, interact and hopefully try to make the best of ourselves and our communities. Um, so, so the answer to, you know, what is the answer to countering um, extremism, hate, and disinformation, um, it, the answer cannot only be a technical answer, right? It has to go, devolve back to the kinds of topics and issues that we've heard about over the last few days. These are, um, these are community issues. These are root cause issues. These are, you know, issues with um, various um, resource or uh, political or social or economic um, root causes that, um, that are finding their manifestation in these online spaces. Um, so I think that, you know, I think that's the, that's the belief that uh, we continue to hold that, you know, I think the John Stuart Mills, if we put ideas into the marketplace of ideas that eventually, um, hopefully, the good um, outweigh the bad, um, but I think that, again, that depends on people showing up to this conversation. What does it mean to be a citizen in a democratic uh, age, but also that it is a digital age, right? How can we maintain civic discourse online? How can we maintain kindness online? Um, and I think, you know, some of the work that we do to, uh, like, expand access to, to voter participation and, um, you know, like, we use our, one of the things that I'm really excited about is using, like, Xbox and Bing. We registered um, 146,000 new voters in 2020. Um, and this past election cycle used LinkedIn ads to recruit over 800 poll workers. So I think it's exciting to try to use tools um, that tech enables in order to expand access, in order to um, update our norms of democratic citizenship and the ability to participate in the digital age. Um, but at the end of the day, we still need to, you know, keep an eye on one another and strengthen our communities and our connections and not let the virtual spe space be the only space that we engage and try to take care of each other. These are human issues and they require human conversations as well. Zach, final thoughts? Yeah, just to piggyback what Dina and Amy both said, I think, um, one, we talk or hear a lot about this all of society approach, and I think, to me, in sort of simple terms, I mean, government has a role to play, tech companies and platforms have a role to play, there's an educational need um, that's more, you know, generational, I think journalists have a role to play in exposing bad actors, and then I think it really kind of the least talked about is those that can sort of get in the sandbox and compete need to do so and need the tools to do so, and if enough companies, let's say, with selfish, selfish interest are doing that, there is a societal benefit, at least that's what I believe. And two, I think when we talk about um, uh, disinformation or a narrative, if it's already out there, it may be too later. We're talking about these very kind of creative ways to mitigate, um, you know, in the moment. I think it's a much more proactive opportunity and uh, something that we talk a lot about is this idea of battle for availables. And with any issue, you can sort of segment the population into supporters, rejectors, and in the middle of these availables. And I think so often we think about somebody that doesn't trust the results of an election. How do we convince them that the results are trustworthy rather than saying it's those people that don't really feel strongly that they can or can't trust the results in the middle there that we really need to be conscious of? How do we make sure that they're moving more towards trusting than not trusting in future elections to make sure that at least 51 percent of, or ideally more, but at least a majority of people moving forward are going to trust the results of the election, regardless of which candidate wins. Right.
Well, look, I want to um, thank our panelists for a, a really interesting discussion. Um, and I think sort of the bottom line is, uh, uh, you know, these are, as Zach said, very tricky issues, but they're also super important and one that we need to uh, uh, continue to talk about. So thanks a lot.